Recently, a commenter by the name of KT Joy brought up a movie I haven't thought about in... Jeez, it's gotta be years. This comment sent me down memory lane and made me realize that, yeah, actually there is probably something I could say about this movie. So let's take a look at Barbie Fairytopia from a disabled perspective. Here's a fun fact and a little something that might give you some insight into the kind of person I am. The height of Teenage Rebellion for me was watching the Barbie movies. <laughs> because my mom refused to let me watch them as a kid, and then one time I managed to watch one at a friend's house. It was the Twelve Dancing Princesses, I think. And after that, once I grew up enough to have my own laptop, well, I was off to the races. <laughs> Just watching those sweet, forbidden, pink, glittery movies. <laughs> But that was, of course, years ago, and I've since forgotten a lot about them. <laughs> the only one I watched more than once was Princess Charm School. I know The Princess and the Pauper is one of those real popular ones, but honestly, if you ask me, Charm School is where it's at. This video, though, is about Fairytopia. The first one. We don't need to talk about the sequels. For reasons which will become abundantly clear. So, uh... Spoiler warning, I suppose, for a Barbie movie that came out in 2005. <laughs> the story of Fairytopia is, well, it's a Barbie movie. It's hardly groundbreaking. It centers on Elena, played, as always, by Barbie herself. Elena is a wingless flower fairy who lives in the magic meadow inside a sentient, possibly tulip? I mean, her name is Peony, but this sure as hell ain't a peony, so who knows. She's also followed around by the most annoying Barbie sidekick ever created. I despise this blue puffball. I cannot stand him. His name is Bibble. And wherever he goes, eardrums are cursed. When the Magic Meadow is threatened by a mysterious sickness, which is causing people to lose their ability to fly, and the guardian fairy of the meadow, Topaz, is kidnapped, Elena takes it upon herself to make the trek to the neighboring fairy town, to speak with their guardian, Azura. At first, her friend Dandelion tries to accompany her, but she too is struck by the sickness, and Elena sends her home. She reaches Fairytown and manages to sneak past Azura's shockingly ineffective guards to speak with her. Azura is at first reasonably suspicious, but notices that Alina has the rainbow in her eyes, which apparently means she is destined for greatness. They have a conversation over tea about the friends we haven't met yet, before Azura announces that she is off to see the dryad Dahlia in the morning to ask for her help. Dahlia was once loyal to Laverna, who is the big bad of this movie and the twin sister to the... Queen? Of the fairies? The Enchantress. So she might have some insight on how to stop her. Azura also gives Alina her necklace for safekeeping. As a small side note, I could have sworn, before I rewatched this movie, that Elena was supposed to be either the Enchantress's or Laverna's long-lost daughter, but I'll save you all some time and trouble because apparently not. Anyway, Laverna is the one who's been kidnapping all of the Guardians and spreading this green mist that is making people sick. Her whole plan here is first to gather the power in the Guardians' necklaces, gifted to them by the Enchantress, then to weaken the population of Fairytopia and set herself up as the only source of a cure for them. Which, as far as diabolical plans from villains in children's movies go, not bad. This one actually seems somewhat viable. But, of course, her henchmen are completely incompetent clones, artificial life forms, they're all called Fungus and look completely identical, so I'm going to assume she created them. Also, um... Well... 
As problematic villain designs go, this one is rather blatant, isn't it? Pretty sure I've seen this guy's cousin on any number of anti-Semitic propaganda posters. <laughs> it's not great. Anyway, when Laverna gets her hands on Azura, she notices, of course, that the necklace is missing. You know, I can't help but think this might have been easier if she'd just managed to snatch each of the necklaces, no kidnapping involved. But then, I guess she wouldn't have anyone to monologue at. But without the necklace, the whole plan is a non-starter. So now Laverna is after this mysterious fairy with no wings. Meanwhile, Elena has met a new friend, Hugh the Butterfly, and that's H-U-E, as in a hue of color, not H-U-G-H, as in the human name. <laughs> he has been tasked by Azura to take her where she needs to go, which she decides, after discovering that Azura has been kidnapped, is the Wildering Woods. With a quick pit stop at a cove with some merfolk to set up the sequel, once in the Wildering Woods, Hugh begins to feel the effects of the sickness but is determined to push on, because getting Elena where she needs to be is his job. Elena won't have that and forces him to land and actually take care of himself while she continues on foot. She meets a pair of random, weird, rhyming gnomes. Do we know the Wildering Wood? <laughs> well, we live here, ma'am, we certainly should. Who take her to Dahlia who lives inside of a tree because she's a dryad. And I guess I'm the fool for expecting a dryad to look any different from your bog-standard fairy. Elena manages to convince Dahlia to help, and makes her way to Laverna's palace, unwittingly giving Laverna the one thing she needs to complete her plan. Laverna casts a spell, using Elena's social ostracization as a link between them, and prodding at all of Elena's insecurities, promising her wings of her own, if she just cooperates. The spell takes root, presumably because Laverna's hit close enough to the truth for it to worm its way in, but just as all seems hopeless, Azura manages to break through to Elena, and this happens. I don't need your wings, Laverna! And that's that, right? Bravo, good show, round of applause, let's all go home. Right? Well, yes and no. The final scene of the movie sees Elena returned to the Magic Meadow, this time as a hero, greeted with joy by her former bullies, all the stuff you'd expect, and then... Then the Enchantress shows up, and says that for her bravery, Elena deserves a gift. Does she give Elena a choice on this gift? No. <laughs> she just clips a butterfly necklace around Elena's neck, which grants her wings and flies off without so much as a by your leave. And that's the movie. That's where it ends. So let's talk about that, shall we? <laughs> Obviously, it's a Barbie movie. And it's a Barbie movie from 2005. I don't think I need to go into the regular critiques around how the animation looks weird and very cursed in places, or the sometimes awkward voice acting. What I will do is talk about how it handled disability, because everything else is ultimately surface level, representing a marginalized community even when you're doing it through means which do not exist in our world, is not. And yes, I'm serious, Alina spends well, the entire runtime of this film, honestly, as a disabled protagonist. She's a fairy. The standard able-bodied body for a fairy is one with functional wings. She does not have wings, ergo she is disabled. Early on, we see the pixies mock her for it, but we also see that she's clearly comfortable in herself. Their remarks slide off her, and she's obviously quite comfortable navigating the Magic Meadow on foot, because she's had to do that all of her life. Even her home, Peony, seems perfect for her accessibility needs, extending down a leaf to serve as a ramp for her to enter from ground level. It's a solid start, and... Then there's Alina's relationship with Dandelion. 
They're obviously friends, but even so, when Alina suggests that she should go to Fairy Town, Dandelion immediately questions her ability to make the journey on foot. It's only when Alina begins to take her seriously that Dandelion backs off and changes her mind, determining to come along and help her. Then, when Alina actually gets to Fairy Town, they have probably inadvertently put a scene in here which is so goddamn relatable to me, despite the obviously fantastical setting. This goddamn town hall entry desk. God, if that visual doesn't perfectly encapsulate how it feels to be a wheelchair user in a place where all the customer service stations rise above your head. Further in, we get abruptly confronted with just how inaccessible this world is to someone like Alina. She's apparently lucky to have grown up in the Magic Meadow because Fairy Town is a death trap for anyone who can't fly. It's only because she got the bright idea to use a flower as a parachute that she was even somewhat able to navigate and find her way to Azura. And Azura's home? Once again, a nightmare as far as accessibility is concerned. Sure, Azura has magic which allows her to entertain flightless guests, but this layout very clearly hammers home that this world is built for people who can fly. Then we have Elena, as the local disabled person, having to take charge and talk sense into people when they're getting sick and still trying to push themselves. When Dandelion starts losing her ability to fly, she says she'll just walk. But... Elena reminds her that while she herself is used to walking, Dandelion is not. It would be too hard for her. When Hugh tries to keep going despite becoming ill, Elena has to pull the brakes. She's used to taking her limits into account and planning around them, so she speaks with a certain weight when it comes to not pushing oneself. The concept of a story wherein suddenly everyone has a disability so only the character who's lived with it for their entire life can save the day is one I've never known quite how to feel about. Sure, I love stories that center disabled protagonist, but it feels kind of weird and bad when our only opportunity to be heroes comes after literally everyone around us has been taken out of the running. But all of this, ultimately, is small potatoes compared to the last and greatest sin of this movie, giving Elena wings at the end. The message of this movie is what makes you different makes you special, which is fine enough as simplistic messages for kids go, but of course it does feel a little bit gross too, because I prefer to think that what makes each of us special has nothing to do with the immutable facts about our own selves. But either way, this ending goes directly against that message and utterly ruins Alina's triumphant moment in the final conflict against Laverna. Even if we ignore the disability aspect for a moment, it utterly ruins the emotional impact of Alina rejecting Laverna's wings. From a disability perspective, it's awful because we have someone coming in and curing a disabled person without even talking to them about it first, just assuming that naturally this is what they want and going for it. The only possible saving grace is that the spell comes from a necklace, meaning Alina could take it off, so it kind of serves as an assistive device. If I am feeling incredibly generous, which, to be honest, I am not. From a purely analytical story perspective, it's also complete garbage, because it ruins the impact of Elena giving up her one chance at having wings in order to save her home and everyone she cares about. Essentially, it doesn't matter. No matter what she'd done, she'd have gotten wings. It's an extremely flat, disappointing ending, even without the unfortunate implications. And of course, in the sequels, her wings are hardly ever touched upon again. There is some drama in the direct sequel where she has to risk possibly losing her wings again to save the Mermaid Kingdom, but arguably the higher stakes there are that she might permanently become a mermaid and have to leave her life on land entirely. She is just able-bodied now. That is her reward for saving Fairytopia.
she doesn't get a choice in what her reward should be. It is forced upon her with no explanation, simply the assumption that it is what's right for her and what she wants. Once again, able-bodied people thinking they know what's best for us. Lovely. And honestly, the worst part is that I don't even think this was malicious. I honestly don't think the creators of this movie even realized what they were doing. It's entirely possible that they never even considered Alina disabled. After all, from a human perspective, she's not. But within the story they wrote, she is, and it's made for a truly unfortunate portrayal. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, consider liking it and maybe subscribing. I will be back here Thursday after next. Bye.